lower court didn't buy it. Uh, appellate court didn't buy it. They refused to consider the, the negligence claim under that circumstance. Uh, said you can't have, can't have genetic proof of dangerousness if there's been no dangerous prior act. Okay, that's in the third department, our department. Second part, a little bit of a different case. Uh, we had a heifer cow broke away from its handler at a county fair. I think this was down in the Kipsey area, I believe. Um, a group of the plants were trampled when the cow went to preserve. The cow had never been dangerous before, never been spoofed before in crowds. Um, the court found in that circumstance, this is what I was discussing before, since that cow weighed in excess of 1,000 pounds and could have done severe damage to a bunch of people at the fair, that the handler should have known that heifers generally, generally speaking, heifers can generally be spooked because of the age of the cow. And they found the point. I have a question with regards to that, being that this involves another location and the layers of coverage that come into play when you're at a location like this. Like as far as your insurance coverage? As far as your insurance coverage, yes. Kevin? Who, like primary, secondary, in a situation like this, who would- hey, You mean as far as umbrella coverage? Well, well, yeah, or the order of, if you've got multiple coverages in place, the fair obviously has a policy, the animal owner, water should have a policy. If okay, the handler was okay, that's a good question. Do you, do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, you should make sure you have a contract between you and the fair that's going to apportion the liability. Um, the contract is very important to decide who's going to be liable for what. Uh, it gets very technical, but generally as a public policy uh, purpose in New York, we don't allow people to contract away their negligence entirely. Um, so you know, a large construction company can't hire a subcontractor and say, well, we're a large construction company. Uh, if you want to work on this job, you're going to be responsible for our negligence entirely. Um, you can't do that as a matter of public policy. Um, but you can apportion it um, through who procures the insurance and who bears some of the risk of loss. Um, would it be broken down pro rata or would it be potentially stacked coverage? Well, you're, it's, it's going to be different. You're, you're talking the difference between liability and coverage. Um, liability is going to be found by the jury. Um, they're going to determine that uh, you, know, you as the owner of the cow is, let's say, 50% liable and the fair for not putting up a, a fence is 50% liable. Um, in that case, uh, hopefully your insurance company is going to pick up your 50% and the fair's insurance company will pick up their 50%. Now, if you have an agreement between you and the fair that allocates insurance, um, that agreement you know, may say that, well, the fair's insurance company is going to pick up 100% of that as they're providing insurance. But again, that's all done by the contract generally. Does the registration form count as a contract? It can't. Sure signed by both of you. Um, it's probably not going to, uh, it's probably going to have some waiver language in it. It's not going to hold up as a waiver, but um, it could potentially count as a contract. Yeah, any, anything, if it's signed by two people and has certain terms in it, it can be a contract. Or it could not be a contract. <laughs> uh, kids. Kids are a special little group. Uh, Colorusso. Um, these, these couple cases here are uh, incredible acts of stupidity. Uh, child's bitten by a 75 pound dog that the owner of a daycare facility allowed to wander around that daycare facility. Now, who in their right mind would do that? But it happened. Um, now the issue of fact we had in the case was whether or not the infant's actions towards the dog, uh, I think the kid went over and hugged the dog around the neck or something. Uh, and the dog's response to the action were foreseeable by the owner. Okay, another interesting thing to consider along with that. A kid under four years old is incapable of being responsible for his or her own actions. Okay, in a matter of law, he's incapable of being responsible. It's just gonna push off on the owner. Uh, who in their right mind would do that anyway? Um, it deserves to be sued, in my opinion. Uh, defenses to this action. Um, we raise what's called affirmative defenses. Um, generally, we have a laundry list of defenses when somebody gets sued that we'll put in a document that's called an answer. Um, we're going to put in some special ones for animals. Uh, first thing we're going to say 
even whether or not it's true, that you weren't keeping or harboring the animal at the time. Uh, because legally, even though you may think you're keeping or harboring it, legally you may not have been. So we're going to raise that as a defense. When, when I say it's not true, I don't want you to mean we're doing something untruthful, but uh, whether or not it's legally truthful is a difference. Um, an affirmative defense can be raised if the animal is being tormented, teased, or abused. If someone comes in your barn and you know, whacks the cow, whacks the horse, and gets kicked, um, you know, obviously they caused that. Um, it wasn't due to any, anything that the cow did or the horse. Uh, and anytime you see these underlying things here with all these numbers and um, crazy abbreviations, uh, that's called a case citation. And that's how you can um, look up these cases. If you go on the internet to Google Scholar, um, Google Scholar has pretty much just about any case that I'll cite here. Um, you plug in this number set and it'll pull it up. You can read the case. Uh, you can also raise an affirmative defense. The plaintiff himself had knowledge that the animal was vicious. He went in the stall anyway. Great defense. It works. At least in the first part. Uh, we can also have express and implied assumption of the risk. Okay, that's where the waiver comes in. Okay, you're riding our horses. Uh, we're going out on a trail ride. You assume the risk that you can run your head into a branch. You assume the risk that the horse will tumble in the creek and you'll fall down and break your head open. Uh, the CPLR, which is the rules that govern lawsuits, uh, covers that in those sections. Uh, knowledge. We're going to talk about your knowledge a little bit more in depth. Uh, the breed is not determinative of the viciousness. Uh, in New York, you could not pass a law as a municipality that a certain breed of animal is vicious or is banned. Um, you see this all the time. They try to pass laws banning pit bulls, banning Rottweilers, um, things like that. Uh, they don't hold up in New York State as a matter of law. Uh, same thing goes for the bull, for example. You can't bring in an expert that says this breed of bull is genetically vicious. Uh, it doesn't hold up in New York. Uh, the behavior which causes the injury, is it inherently vicious? Uh, is a horse that's difficult to handle vicious? We're getting into a gray area here, kind of like the slipping off the horse and whether or not the horse bucks. Uh, it's a gray area. That's something that's going to come out in your testimony uh, about the characteristics of that particular animal. And it can go either way. Um, if the animal's never shown vicious propensities, or that the animal's past behavior is not a vicious propensity, for example, barking at neighbors by a dog. Not vicious. All dogs probably bark at the neighbors. Um, dog goes over, runs up and down the property line, you know, growls and snarls only at the neighbor's wife. Uh, you probably have knowledge that the dog doesn't like the neighbor's wife, and if he gets out, he's going to bite her. So two, two different ways barking can be looked at. Uh, a natural reaction on part of the animal is not vicious. Um, in the wingless case, um, guy picked up the cat, oops, grabbed it by the scruff of the neck. Uh, of course, the cat turned around and bit him. Well, obviously. Natural reaction to defend itself. Uh, you also have uh, defenses you can use if a dog, for example, is defending uh, a litter of puppies, uh, its offspring. Uh, that's a defense. Uh, that's a penalty. What are they right here? Yeah, just with the dog bite, there was no provocation. <coughs> Nothing had ever happened before. Both the defendant and his girlfriend testified they owned the dog for years. They didn't experience any problems with the dog prior to that one act of biting and that the dog never displayed any act of aggression immediately prior to the bite. Just boom, went over and bit somebody. The breed alone was not enough to tip the scales in favor of the plaintiff on that one. Uh, that was just in 2006. Uh, third department really rams this home all the time. Uh, always people trying to get in the breed of the pit bull, the Rottweiler. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, just a few months ago, uh, the Court of Appeals for Maryland, Maryland's highest court, uh, held that as a matter of law, any pit bull or pit bull breed dog is vicious as a matter of law. If you own a pit bull in the state of Maryland, you are assumed to own a vicious dog, and you will be strictly liable for that animal's actions no matter what. Uh, hopefully that's going to be overturned by the legislature, but we're waiting to see. Uh, not a good precedent. How does this work in terms of being a stallion versus a gelding? Where does that still kind of fall into 
You know, Stallions are known to be a little more aggressive. But I don't think it would be a, a, an issue um, unless it was, you know, it's going to be particular to that. If, if that Stallion al always bucked and threw people or snapped out at people every time I was trying to be fed, um, you'd have an issue. But I, I don't think, I, I think that's going to come down, um, you know, very similar to, to where the bull pinned the guy up against the wall. But just because it's a bull, uh, you know, as opposed to, to a female, it's, it's more aggressive. Well, genetically maybe, but um, that's not good enough without the prior act. Uh, I think in the second department, the first department downstate, you're in that gray area where they might say, yeah, there's a special duty here because you know, stallions are um, you know, bigger, more muscular, and uh, more prone to, to buck. Um, but up here, I think you're fine. Uh, you don't have to have direct contact with the animal. Um, this one's very relevant for horses and cows. Um, in dog bite cases, we see in the United Parcel Service uh, as a plaintiff quite a bit, <laughs> or the post office or FedEx. Um, but the vicious dog in this case, uh, vicious dog chased the ups man out into the street, and uh, the ups man was struck by the car. So the dog never actually bit him, uh, just chased him, and uh, there was liability imposed there because the dog had chased on previous occasions. Uh, landlord and borders. Uh, landlord can be a border, a border can be a landlord. Uh, if you, as a landlord, have knowledge of that vicious propensity of an animal on your property, you have a duty to protect the public, protect the other customers that are coming to the place. Um, you know, if you've got the horse that somebody is keeping at your stable, and it's bucking all the time, it's you know, ramming into the stall, biting, uh, you got to tell that person that, thank you, please. We'll refund your security clause. Uh, however, if the landlord has no knowledge, uh, we have two kinds of knowledge in the law. We have actual knowledge and constructive knowledge. Actual knowledge is, yes, I saw the ice on the floor two hours before the plane slipped, and I didn't do anything about it. Um, constructive knowledge was, well, there was somebody at the front desk, one of my employees, they should have seen the ice two hours prior to the slip. Um, if you don't have actual or constructive knowledge, you can't have any liability. Um, so liability will also not be imposed on the landlord where the attack occurs off of the property that's being rented. Where this can get slipped.